directing. That was so powerful. And uh, so grateful for all of our volunteer teams here this morning. Thank you to our worship team, our amazing production team, our, our ushers, uh, our kids ministry, obviously with Zoraida and her team. So grateful to be a part of a church that understands that it, it takes more than one person to make a church run and function. It takes the people of God. And so we're just so grateful for all of our SIR teams this morning. Well, hey, listen, again, just want to officially welcome all of you to Resurrection Sunday 2022. We're so grateful that God has seen fit to bring us to this place. And again, especially if you're new and joining us for the first time today, we are honored. And I don't just say that lightly. It, it, it is an honor that you would be with us here today. We don't think it's an accident that you're here today. I believe, and it's my conviction, that God purposed and ordained for you to be sitting in the seat that you're now occupying. Because he has a word that he wants to speak to you this morning. He has something that he wants to speak directly to your heart here today. And so uh, if you are joining us for the first time, we're going to be concluding our Easter sermon series that we began earlier in this month called Stories Within the Story. How many of you have been blessed by this sermon series so far, if you have been with us? I hope that it has encouraged you. I hope that it's challenged you uh, as well. And, you know, one of the fascinating aspects of Scripture is how God intricately weaves these smaller sub-stories into the story of Easter that helps us to draw closer and closer to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what we had studied over the past few weeks is how the characters in these sub-stories were impacted by the resurrection, causing them and us today to draw closer more than ever before to the person of Jesus. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to unpack one more of these sub-stories here today. And we're going to see how this story was, and it's the title of my message today, A Walk to remember. I walk to remember. Now, I'll admit, I am not the biggest fan of walking. Anybody just willing to admit that here this morning? You don't like walking. Okay, there's like three or four of us. We're going to start a coalition, the Not Liking Walking Coalition, okay? And I'll lead the charge. I do not like walking, okay? I've got nothing against it as a form of exercising or a hobby. I could just think of about a hundred other things I'd want to do first before going walking. Now, my wife, Alyssa, on the other hand, she loves to walk. She especially likes to go for walks with our kids. And for her, walking has always been a very pleasant experience, except for that one time when we were on our honeymoon. Let me, let me explain what, what had happened on our honeymoon. So my family's from Italy. My mom immigrated here, and she still, uh, by the grace of God, owns the house that she was born and raised in. And so we thought, man, this would be great. We can go on our honeymoon. We can stay there. You can see where my mom grew up, where I used to go and spend summers with my family. And it's just going to be an awesome time. So we're going to go for our honeymoon to Italy. Now, unbeknownst to my wife, Alyssa, my mom's house was on top of the hill that was on top of the hill that was on top of that hill. And you can see where I'm going with this this morning, right? Okay. And now we had just found out prior to leaving that she was pregnant with our first Gemma. Now, before anyone starts to say, well, hold up. You're going on your honeymoon, and you guys are already pregnant. Two and One and one is not equaling two here. We went on our honeymoon a year after we got married, okay? So for anyone wondering, Pastor Pat, what's going on here? We waited. Trust me. I promise, okay? But now still, my wife had an upbeat attitude about it. She was confident that that walk up that series of hills was going to be no problem at all for her. Well, fast forward. By the second day, she is pronouncing curses over this hill. She is cursing every stone that's in the ground. She's cursing the very day that that hill was formed by God. And let's just say that the walk up this hill day in and day out while pregnant made what was once enjoyable virtually unenjoyable for her. And we have a good memory now to laugh about it in the end. So I suppose it, it was for something. It turned into a sermon illustration. So as a pastor, let me tell you something. When the story turns into a sermon illustration, we're, we're doing really, really well. Well, today, we're going to look at an account of a walk that started off unenjoyable. Matter of fact, it started off very unenjoyable. Two people making a journey of despair, but along the road, they experienced the most thrilling event of their entire lives. And we're going to see here in just a few short moments that this was definitely a walk to remember. And so if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. It's uh, on the day of the resurrection. We're going to pick up the story Right in verse 13, if you don't have a Bible, it's going to come up on the screen behind me. Hey, if you do not have a Bible in here, please come see me or one of the pastors after service is over. We will gift you a Bible. You need to be equipped with the Word of God. Amen. Okay, verse 13. I'm going to be reading this from the New Living Translation. And here's what it says. It says this. <clears throat> that same day, 
Two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. Now, I could picture Jesus like in the next verse saying to himself, what things? <laughs> like I can picture Jesus knowing that they don't recognize him yet and he's just probably having like a fun little moment at their expense right now, right? He said, and they said, the things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth. And again, I could picture saying, Jesus saying, who's he? <laughs> right? They said he was a prophet who did powerful miracles. He was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Verse 22, then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing and that they'd seen angels who had said, Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all of these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them. Verse 30, as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them, and suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us? as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us. And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who had said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. And then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they walked along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. Can we all bow our heads and just open up in a word of prayer? Father, I pray in Jesus' name that just like it was in our story, that, Lord, our hearts would burn within us this morning as you open us up to your holy scriptures. God, it is my prayer that the spirit of the living God would make the very words that you're going to speak through me, your servant, God, come alive in our hearts and in our minds today. God, I pray that your word would burn like a fire in the hearts of every single person who is within earshot of my voice. I pray, God, that our hearts would be like good soil that receives the seed of your word and that, God, as we hear and as we respond to your word this morning, that, God, it would mark people's lives, that we would be touched by the power of your word and that we would walk out of here, God, changed and touched by the power of Almighty God. Let it be so, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In our story, within the story, we find two men that had sadness written across their faces. And when Jesus asks them why they stopped dead in their tracks, they were stunned that anybody wouldn't know the cause for their sorrow. Because, again, their very lives had just been rocked. I mean, think about this for perspective. Oftentimes, I think we fail to enter into the emotion of Scripture when we're reading it. These two disciples had probably forsaken everything to follow Jesus. They had come to believe that he was the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and they had forsaken everything to follow Jesus. And so when they see who they thought to be the Messiah, brutally tortured, crucified, nailed to a cross, and die, to them... All their hopes had just gone up in smoke. It's an amazing thing how quickly what you thought was going to be your life, how it could just come to an end just like that. For some, if not most of the people in this room, that's probably how the last few years have felt for us. 
I think the events of the last few years have caused many people to feel like their very lives are in a free fall. Things that we thought maybe would always be a part of our lives were uprooted. And as a result, it plunged many people into a season of grief. And that's where the two people in our story find themselves. They were downcast and sad as they walked because it seemed like all their hopes were dashed after Jesus' crucifixion and death. And then as Jesus has a habit of doing, he comes and he enters right into the middle of their story to brighten their perspective and to inform their understanding. Not to change their situation, not to deny the reality of what had just happened, the pain that they had just endured watching Jesus brutalized on a cross, but to help them see it from a different perspective. And that's what I want to do for all of us here this morning. I, I want to point to three powerful truths from our passage today that I believe is not only going to change your perspective on your own circumstances today, but it's going to help you to draw closer to the reality of the resurrection. You all with me this morning? Amen. Here's our first truth. If you're taking notes, I would encourage you to write this down, and it's this. The circumstances that you face aren't nearly as important as the conclusions you draw. It's a little bit long. Let me say that to you again. The circumstances that you face aren't nearly as important as the conclusions that you draw about those circumstances. See, the problem wasn't what happened. The problem was the conclusions that these two had come to as a result of what had happened. Now, as we read our passage this morning, it tells us that the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus was a seven-mile distance to travel. Thank God this wasn't me. I hate walking. We already established that, right? And the scriptures, they don't really tell us how long Jesus would have been walking alongside of them, just listening silently as they poured out their hearts to what was a stranger to them, at least, at that point, right? And that's probably a good lesson for us here today. If, you're, if you ever have the privilege of walking alongside someone who's going through a season of grief, the best thing you could do is just listen and silently. The gift of your presence will do more for a person in a season of grief than any words you have to say to them. I can promise you that. But I digress. So finally... After they had spoken enough, Jesus finally speaks to them. And when he speaks to them, he begins to challenge all of their assumptions about what had happened. Following his crucifixion and death, again, they had assumed that their hopes of Jesus being the Messiah, of him redeeming Israel, that that was all over. And let me ask the question here today, why were they even headed to Emmaus in the first place? Very simple, the party was over in Jerusalem. In our passage, we find the answer to that question. They had lost their hope. It actually says three different times that they had hoped. Verse 19, look what it says. It says, he was a prophet. Verse 21a, we had hoped. Verse 21b, he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Now notice in all these three statements, what are they doing? They're using past tense. See, they thought that their best days were behind them. They thought that the teachings were done, the miracles were done, all the great and mighty things that Jesus had done in their midst, it's all done. Now notice something here with me. Notice that Jesus didn't deny what had happened. He didn't deny the fact that he had died before their very eyes. He didn't say that the circumstances were difficult. What he was saying was is that their assumptions about what had happened were incorrect. Now let me just say here to all of you today, I don't know what some of you are facing here in your own life this morning. You may be walking through a valley season in your life. It may be very difficult. It may be marked with pain and suffering. I don't ever want to minimize what a person is going through. But my question here today is this, is what conclusion are you coming to about the season that you're walking through right now? See, these two disciples were suffering under the weight of a story that wasn't true. Jesus had died. But here's the question I want to pose to us this Easter. Who told you to use past tense? See, these two disciples thought that they were walking in I was, but they were actually walking with I am. Come on, somebody. See, Jesus was trying to help them to understand. You guys think I was, but newsflash, I am. I did die, but behold, I am alive. And if you're here and you've been using the past tense, my business was, my life was, my dream was, my marriage was, my relationships was. I want to submit to you this morning that from our passage reading, Jesus is telling us, I've got more in front of you than there is behind you. 
Come on, somebody. That what you thought was a setback in your life is actually a setup for something greater that lies ahead. You see, why is it important the conclusions we draw about the circumstances we face? Because one perspective will cause you to view your circumstances as a setback, and another perspective will cause you to view them as a setup. Let's come to different conclusions about the same circumstances. Because once their assumptions were challenged, they began to think correctly. And here's why that's important. Understand this, church. Wrong thinking will always lead to wrong living. Your thoughts dictate your actions. The Bible says that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. See, these two disciples were operating off of inaccurate information. And when we operate off of inaccurate information, it always leads to unnecessary fear. They were afraid. They were running from Jerusalem because they knew that the only thing that was waiting for them there was possible arrest and that they would end up on a cross just like Jesus. And so they were, they were running. They were leaving. But once they began to think correctly, they were opened up to a life of hope. And that word hope is a powerful, powerful word. I love what Pastor Charles Swindoll says. He says this, life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. Listen, and there are people in this room, you've traveled many more times around the sun than I have. And you know this probably better than most of the young people in this room. You and I can't control what happens to us in this life. Can't. Loss of a job. Loss of a business. Loss of health. Dare I say even the loss of a loved one. The last few years have been marked with a little bit of all of that, haven't they? But that's only 10%. The other 90%, and I'm, I'm probably speaking more to the Christians in this room, but my hope and my prayer is, is that you'll want to make a decision for Jesus by the time we're done here today. But the other 90% is us kneeling down before the maker of heaven and earth and saying, God gives and God takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. That in all of our situations, church, no matter how dire they may appear to be, that we will choose to respond in faith. That we will choose to worship despite our circumstances. And that we will declare that our God is good even when life isn't. Come on, because that's our God. I want to submit to you this morning. I don't know where you are here today. You may not even be a Christian. I want to tell you that there is a God who is good when life isn't. There is a God who is good even when things in your life don't seem fair and don't seem right. And what I see in our passage this morning is that when Jesus helped these two disciples see the same situation differently, they had potential that was unlocked by perspective. What, what do I mean by that? Notice that they had previously viewed walking any further as a futile endeavor. When Jesus indicated that he was going further on, they insisted he come and stay with them instead. Why would you go any further? It's too dark to go any farther. We've come to the end of our journey. Our, our time is over. However, once they were aware of what was actually going on, they were given a hope that enabled them to see things differently, didn't they? The Bible says that at that very hour, they left and traveled the seven-mile distance back to Jerusalem. It didn't matter how dark it was outside, how difficult the journey was, because knowing that Jesus was alive made all the difference in the world. And here's why this is so important, church. Because hope will give you the power to embrace what you previously wanted to escape. They wanted to be anywhere but Jerusalem. See, because Jerusalem was filled with reminders of things that they did not want to remember. Triggers of the pain and the trauma from having watched the one that they love, who they'd committed to following, being brutalized beyond reckoning. The Bible says that Jesus was marred so horrifically and gruesomely that he didn't look like who they'd seen him to be. The skin from his flesh literally peeled off. He was unrecognizable. And that's all they could remember of that moment. And church, I understand what it's like to want to run from things that you don't want to embrace. 
You know, before I came to faith in Christ, there were things that I didn't want to embrace. Things that I had done, things that had been done to me that I would have rather locked away in a box and thrown in the bottom of the ocean before ever acknowledging. But when I found hope in a Savior, when I came to realize that Jesus was who the Bible says that he is, and I encountered him for myself for the first time, I was given a hope that caused me to embrace the things that I once wanted to run away from, and I was actually able to find not just healing from those things, but I was able to realize that those things, yes, they were bad and terrible, but God was going to use them to achieve a greater glory than I could have ever imagined he would ever do. And if you're in Christ here today, praise God, if you're in Christ, that's your story as much as it's my story. That's why, you say, Pastor Pat, why are you such a passionate person? Why do you preach so passionately? Because this message has the power to change lives. You see, when Jesus walked with them, they didn't realize, finally, for the first time in three days, that all wasn't lost. They were able to embrace what they originally wanted to escape. Church, I want to encourage you this morning, please don't put a period where God intended a comma. So often we put periods where God says, I never told you to put that. Who, who told you to put that there? I didn't tell you to put that there. What you think is a setback. Could it be possibly that it's actually a setup? And what Jesus was saying to these two disciples then, and what he's saying to us now is don't use the past tense when I am the God who is still working in the present in order to set up your future, your destiny. We have a God who once he saves us, he puts us on a trajectory where we have a destiny and an agenda and an assignment over our lives. And I promise you this, church, if you will start to have come to different conclusions about the same circumstances that you are facing, you will be opened up to a perspective that will unlock potential in your life. And God will enable you to do things that previously you didn't think were possible. All because you're choosing to see your situation differently through a heavenly lens as opposed to an earthly lens. Does that make sense to you this morning? Is that preaching to you this morning? All right, good. Second truth that we take away, and then i got to start boogieing here, is this. Just because I think something doesn't make it true. Okay, i got to say that again. Just because you and I think something doesn't make it true. Okay, I want you to remember that the next time you go to post something on Facebook. Okay, just remember that Pastor Pat said that. Just because we think something, it doesn't make it true. See, these two disciples, and honestly, really all the disciples, they had something totally different in mind for Jesus. They had what they thought to be great plans for him. They thought that he was going to be this political messiah who would reign. And he was going to overthrow the Roman Empire. He was going to usher in a physical kingdom. And what they failed to realize that that was not the kind of kingdom that Jesus came to establish. His was a spiritual one, a heavenly one. And this kingdom that they thought he was going to bring them, right? Thank God, thank God that it wasn't what they thought it was going to be. But the kingdom that he wanted to bring them, that he did ultimately bring them, had he brought it to them first without dying on a cross, they would have never been able to participate in that kingdom. Because unless you're born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He wasn't the king that they had expected. He wasn't the king that they wanted. But he was then and is now the king that we all need. Come on, we don't need a political Messiah. We need a spiritual Messiah, one that's going to save us from the penalty and the guilt and the shame of sin. And see, they had ignored the fact that the entirety of the Old Testament pointed forward to a Messiah who was going to redeem Israel by dying. That was what he was telling them. Hear me, the very same thing that they thought stopped Jesus from redeeming Israel was the one thing that was necessary in order for Israel to be redeemed. And let me help us to understand this morning, they wanted to see the crown but not the cross. They wanted the blessings of what it would look like without the broken Messiah. They wanted to see him on the throne without him ever having to wear a crown of thorns on his head. Church, all too often we do this. We try to write our own script for Jesus. We try to ascribe things to Jesus that we were never meant to ascribe. I see this happen in churches all over the world where they try to paint Jesus in a picture that doesn't align with the Jesus of Scripture. There is a popular but a perverted version, distorted version of the gospel out there that says once you commit your life to Christ, that everything will just become better. All your problems are just going to go away. 
And can I tell you, nothing could be further from the truth. I want to tell you this morning that Jesus didn't come to make your life better. He came to save your soul. That's the resurrection. That's the story of Easter. The Bible says that you and I, we were once far from God. We were objects of the wrath of God because the Bible says like sheep, we had all gone astray. The Bible says it in, in no uncertain terms that you and I, we were enemies of God because of our sin nature, because of our propensity to rebel against God's moral law, to reject his rule and reign over our life. And like we would expect any human judge to execute justice, the God, the just judge of the universe, how much more is he bound by his nature and character to judge sinners justly? He has no choice to because his character demands it. But we have a problem because he doesn't want to judge us. The Bible says that he desires that no man or woman should perish, but that all might come to have everlasting life. So we have a conundrum. There's a God who has to judge us because of our sin, but he doesn't want to because he loves us so much. And so what does he do? He does the unthinkable. God puts on the human suit. And he steps into his own creation and he makes himself known and he goes to the cross and takes our place. The one who knew no sin became sin so that you and I, so that our sins could be forgiven, so that our sins could be atoned for, so that the wrath of God could be satisfied. So that one day when you and I stand before a holy and a just God, we won't try to stand with a righteousness that's our own. We won't try to stand before God based off of our own merit, but we'll be able to stand there cloaked with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and we will hear our God say, come and enter to the kingdom that was prepared for you before the foundations of the world. Come on, church. That's why we call it good news. Because it was looking so bad for us. But praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who made a way when there was no way to be made. There is a peace that Jesus affords those who come to know him as Lord and Savior. He said this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. There is a peace that can only be found in him. In this world you will have trouble, right? Circumstances, suffering. But take heart, I have overcome this world. Come on, someone needs to hear that this morning. You, you need to hear that. I want to tell you, whatever you're going through this morning, if you are in Christ, there is a peace you can tap into that will cause you to take heart because you know the one who has overcome this world. Church, don't suffer under the weight of a story that isn't true. See, the road to Emmaus was a downcast, disappointed, and disillusioned journey simply because these two disciples believed something that wasn't true. Jesus always had a plan. It just wasn't their plan. That's a word for every one of us in here. Can I encourage you as your pastor, be careful that you never superimpose your plan over God's plan. Your plan pales in comparison to his plan. And your plan might be good, might have good intentions behind your plan. Your plan is still second rate and second best compared to his. Don't ever superimpose your timing over God's timing. If right now God has you in a holding pattern, it's because his timing is better than your timing. Some people here today, you're still living under the burden of a story that isn't true. I don't know who I'm speaking to. Maybe you believe the lie that's been said over you for far too long. Today, I want you to walk out in the power and the peace of the resurrection, knowing that there is a God who came from heaven to earth for you, who died in your place, but who rose again three days later to show you that there is a purpose and a plan for the new life that he wants to offer you. That, my friends, is truth for our soul. Amen? Amen. And this leads us to our last and final truth here this morning, and I'll invite the worship team to come up, is this. Is Easter isn't an event. It's an identity. It's not a once a year holiday on the calendar. Easter is an everyday reality. Come on, we're meant to be living in the power of the resurrection today. Amen. Called to be preaching in the power of the resurrection today. Parenting in the power of the resurrection today. Going to our places of work in the power of the resurrection today. You know, I hear people grumble about Mondays. What if you went into your Monday at work realizing and recognizing that you have the power of the resurrection at your disposal to impact and affect change? To your bosses, to your coworkers. Church, we have the power 
that rose Jesus from the dead, readily accessible and available to you and I. It is more than just an event. It is a reality that you and I are called to walk and live in every single minute of the day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We've been filled with the spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the grave. Our best days are in front of us. Come on, somebody. They're not behind us. And I don't care how dark the days are ahead of us. I don't care how evil the days are ahead of us. If you are in Christ, your best days are always in front of you, never behind you. It is always too soon to give up. Some of you, you've been on your own road to Emmaus, but I believe that the Lord is calling you out by name and saying it's time to go back to Jerusalem. It is time to go back to Jerusalem. I want to submit to you this morning that there's nothing that could thwart the plans of Almighty God. And can I just encourage you here this morning? You know, I, I love this. I find this to be one of the most encouraging, simple truths about the Bible. And all you have to do is read the first chapter of Genesis to see it and the last chapter of Revelation. The first chapter of Genesis opens up with God creating everything. And the last chapter in the book of Revelation ends with him sitting on the throne forever and ever and ever. And we who are his people who have been called by name will sit at the table, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we will be there with our God for all of eternity. So here's what I'm saying to you this morning. If right now you're in a season of suffering, it could be uh, 10 months of suffering, it could be 10 years of suffering, I want you to be encouraged this morning, it's not the end. Because the end is when you and I are with Jesus for all of eternity. We'll have new bodies, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. The Bible says that every tear will be wiped away from our faces, there'll be no more pain, no more sadness, no more sorrow, no more addiction, no more child trafficking, all that stuff. It's all going to be done away with and you and I are going to be able to enter into the joy of our Jesus. And there we will be with him for all of eternity, forever and ever and ever and ever. And if you're here today, my goodness gracious, if it doesn't seem like it's working out right now, it just means that it's not the end. Because in the end, we win because he's already won. Come on, we're not going to give up on Saturday scarred by the trauma of Friday. No, we're going to stand on the power of the triumph of Resurrection Sunday. And then we're going to watch that power. It's going to go ahead and bleed into our Mondays. We're going to watch it spill over into our Tuesdays. We're going to see it cascade into our Wednesdays. We're going to see it be a tsunami wave on Thursdays. We're going to watch as it gives us phenomenal power on Friday. And then on Saturday, you and I, we are going to rejoice and marvel at all that our God has done for you and for me. Many people see Easter as an ending. I want to submit to you this morning, it's a beginning. Easter isn't the end of something. It is the beginning of something. It is the beginning of a brand new life that Christ wants to afford each and every one of you. Listen, it's okay to reminisce about the past. It's okay to, to sometimes reflect. But church, we are called to be a people who move forward. The kingdom of God has only one direction, forward. Paul says this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. He says this, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal. Did you see that? There's a goal for your life. If you're in Christ, there is a trajectory that God wants to set you upon. There is a goal that he wants you to strain toward, and it's this, to win the prize for which God has called you and I heavenward in Christ Jesus. Come on, this is not our home, church. We're passing by here. Heaven is our home, but God has kept you and I here for a reason. We are here on assignment to know him and to make him known, to empty hell and to populate heaven. We have a goal, church. We have a date with destiny. Easter is not an event. It is our, our identity. You and I, we are resurrection people. And because we are resurrection people, guess what? You and I are now living as stories within the story. Right? We started this series looking at these characters from the Bible and the sub-stories of the Easter story. Well, guess what? Just as these characters were so greatly impacted by the resurrection, so are you and I. And let me conclude here today. Listen, we're all walking through something. But let me just remind you, though we're walking through something, it's ultimately because we're walking to something. This is not our home. 
you are an alien in this world. Heaven's our home. And one day, when we get there, it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. All that we had to suffer and endure in this life, it will be worth it. How many of you believe that God saves his best for last? How many of you really believe that this morning? I, I hope that you do. Because maybe there's some people here today, and you find yourself like these two disciples. You're walking through disappointment and hurt and pain and loss, and you feel like you're at the end of the road. And here's what I want to remind you of this Easter Sunday. I hope you hear me. Jesus says, I'll take you by the hand, and I'll walk with you. If you would just let Jesus take you by the hand, let him be the Lord of your life, he will lead you and guide you much better than you could ever do. We made a mess of our lives. That's why Jesus had to come from heaven to earth. Jesus says, hey, I'll, I'll come alongside you. You're, you're walking a lonely path. I'll come alongside you. I'll take you by the hand, and I will lead you to places that you can never imagine, and I'll never walk away from you. I want to work for somebody. Your God will never leave you nor forsake you. Maybe for someone else here, you feel like you're on a journey that seems to be going nowhere. Here's what I believe this morning, that the power of the resurrection has the power to help you to see that Jesus has a fresh purpose for your life. Maybe things have gotten stale in your life. I want to submit to you this morning that there is a God who wants to set you on the trajectory where you are literally walking and stepping out in the power and the purpose of Almighty God. Maybe for others of you, your dreams have stalled out here this morning. Come on, just being honest with yourselves. Your spiritual legs are beginning to cramp up and you're wondering, God, what has it been all for? I believe that just like these two disciples, you're going to have a resurgence of spiritual power through the resurrection. And lastly, maybe you're here today and you just, you've seen Jesus work in your life. You, you've been faithful. You've been walking the walk of faith. Here's my prayer for you. A, keep walking. And B, I pray that today this Resurrection Sunday, 2022, that you will be given a fresh view of the person of Jesus Christ. That you will receive a fresh revelation of his resurrection. You see, these two disciples, they'd seen Jesus, but they didn't recognize the resurrected Jesus. I pray that today you would see Jesus in a fresh and a new way. And here's my prayer for you this morning, church, as we close. One day, when you transition from here into eternity, I promise you this that if you will have invited Jesus on this journey with you, and you make him the Lord of your life and let him lead your life, here's what I promise. You'll be able to look back and say of your life, it was a walk to remember. What a difference it made, surrendering my life to Jesus and letting him be the one to lead and rule and reign in my life. And if you do that, I promise you, you will stand before God one day. You'll hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I'm now going to give you much. Enter into the joy of your master. All because we said, Jesus, I want to walk with you in this thing called life. And if you're here this morning and you say to yourself, I've been walking this road on my own terms and I've made nothing but a mess of my life, I want to tell you that there's hope for you today. And it's all found in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you all stand with me this morning as we close in prayer? You know, I would be remiss if I didn't give anybody an opportunity here today to get right with God. I'm going to just ask if any of the members of the altar ministry are here this morning, if you could just make yourselves available to my right and to my left. Um, listen, I prayed it at the beginning of our, our time together. I pray that the word of God was burning in your heart here today. Listen, it, it doesn't take a smart person to know if you're far from God. And maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus. But you know that you're not living right. You know that the life that you're living right now is in direct contradiction to the life that God would have you live. The things that you're doing, the things that you're engaging in. You're not right with God. You're far from God. And if you were to die today, you would not be able to stand before a holy God based off of your own merit. Because the Bible says there's not a good enough, enough good works that you and I can do to atone for a life of sin. That's why Jesus came. He came to accomplish what you and I could never accomplish. And if you're here today and you feel that there's something burning in your heart, there's something that's drawing you to respond this morning, I want to tell you that's the Spirit of God. And He's inviting you to come and to enter into this new life that Jesus died and rose again to offer you. And so here's what I want to do this morning. Can we all just close our eyes and bow our heads this morning? I want to give anybody here an opportunity. If you say, Pat, 
I feel like God is talking to me this morning, and I know that I'm far from God. I know that I need Jesus in my life. I want what you're talking about this morning. I want new life. I don't want to live the way that I'm living this morning anymore. And if that's you here today, and you want to get right with God, and you want to commit to making Jesus the Lord and the Savior of your life, with every head bowed and every eye closed, can you just make a motion of faith and just raise your hand? If that's you here today, and you want to get right with God, you want to forsake the life of sin that you've been living and you want to begin to live this brand new life that Jesus died and rose again for you, I want to encourage you to just make a motion of faith. If that's you, I want to know who I'm praying for this morning. Is there anybody in here that you want to make a decision for Jesus here today? Is there anybody here who says, I need to get my life right with God? Or maybe you're here today and you are born again, but you've strayed away from the heart of God. Maybe you've kind of fallen back into old sin and you just want to recommit and rededicate your life to the Lord Jesus Christ today. I want to tell you, His mercies are new every day. No matter how many steps you've taken away from Jesus, all it takes is one step back to be made right again with Him. If that's you and you want to rededicate or recommit your life to Jesus here this morning, can you just give me a wave of the hand so I know who I'm praying for this morning? I see your hand. You can put it down right there, sir. Thank you. Anybody else, you need to recommit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Praise God. Well, here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to pray, and then we're just going to sing our victory one more time. So, Father, we come before you in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your resurrection. Thank you for the power that it offers us, for the purpose and the meaning that it gives our lives, God. And it's my sincere prayer today, God, that this story that we read out of your word, God, will draw us closer and closer to you, Jesus, closer and closer to the power of the resurrection, that we will be a people who step out in faith, who see the power of your resurrection in the way that we love each other as husband and wife, in the way that we love our kids, God, in the way that we parent, in the way that we go to our jobs, in the way, God, that we go and go about our lives, God. I pray that the power of the resurrection would be evident in our lives and that, God, you would use it, Lord, to impact other people so that we could see hell emptied and heaven populated. Father, we welcome you in this place that the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ would be made manifest in our life, God. That we would see your power at work in us and that, God, we would be able to boldly declare who you are and what you have done because the resurrecting King is resurrecting me. Day by day, you make us a new Lord. And so all we can do is with heartfelt thanks, give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, we all said... Come on, let's just end our time together one more time. Let's just sing this out to Jesus right now. Come on, let's give him all of our hearts, all of our energy this morning. Let's give him the praise and the glory and the honor. Hallelujah. Jesus. Give our God a shout of praise here this morning. Come on, if you're thankful for the power of the resurrection in your life. Here's my encouragement to all of you as I release you this morning. Go therefore in the power of the resurrected Christ who sits on the throne of your heart and go and change the world around you. Go and be the salt and the light of the world. The resurrection changed everything for those disciples. They were fearful, but then once they realized that Jesus was indeed alive, it changed everything. And once the Spirit arrested their hearts, they were able to walk in a power that was not their own. Church, if we are going to see this world saved for the glory of Jesus, we need to walk in faith in the resurrection power of Jesus. 
Every single day, there is a power that God says, I have ready for you to tap into. Let's be a people who tap into it every day so that we can see the world around us turned upside down for the glory and the renown of the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you all, church. I love you. Go in the power of Jesus Christ this morning, knowing that he has done all for you and I. Amen. Amen. God bless you all, church. We'll see you next week. Enjoy your day. Have a blessed rest of your Easter. God bless you all.